We're sitting here again in the lovely Devonshire Club in the City of London, and I'm here with Leon Boros, who's going to talk us through accounts, which for some investors can be quite dry and quite complicated. So we want the Leon Boros version of accounts. So Leon, what do you look at first? Uh, well, I'm typically focusing on the cash flow statement. So when I wake up in the morning and uh, I look at uh, an RNS, uh, I'll see all the blurb there, which would take a long time to read. Uh, but I just go to the, I think, the heart of the matter and look at the way that the cash has moved through the business. I'm particularly interested in seeing how earnings have converted into cash flows. OK. So expand a little bit more with, I think you've got an example of a yes. um, cash flow statement. That's so right. talk us through how okay. we should analyse it. OK, well, there's a company called Telecommunications that have been in the news of late and there's been question marks raised about the quality of its earnings. And so I thought I'd use that, that as, as an example. And so if one looks at their uh, operating cash flow statement, you'll see that uh, they start uh, with a profit after tax of $16.6 .6 million. This was in financial year 16. And companies might start with different profit numbers in okay. their cash flow statements. Um, essentially what they're trying to do is to adjust, take, go from a profit number add back all the non-cash items and then make adjustments for working capital. Mm. Um, and those non-cash items can include things such a, a, as depreciation, mm. which might arise on the spending of, on fixed assets. So that spending was done many years ago, uh, but the cost of it is apportioned over its useful life and therefore mm. you see that in the profit and loss account, but we're not interested in it in the cash flow other than to add that depreciation back. And the same is true for amortisation of intangibles uh, in, and that can arise either through acquisitions or where companies have developed intangibles in-house, so for instance capitalising R&D spend. Uh, and again, there may be a cash cost involved in that, but we're at, when we're adding back those items, we're adding back the amortisation that's arisen on that expenditure that may have happened in the past. And then we're, we're looking at things like tax. We're adding back the tax provision the company has made. It would have paid tax in the year, but in the profit and loss account, you've only got the provision really for the profits that the tax that it will pay on this year's profits. And the same with interest and things like that. Often you'll see a number that's based on an estimate, not on the cash payment. So mm. once you've added back the non-cash items, you're then left with uh, adjustments for working capital. Uh, and in the case of Tellit, for instance, there's uh, quite significant moves. For instance, there's a $30 million dollar movement in its trade receivables, i.e. its trade receivables have increased by $30 million. And that's an increase of 45% on the previous year, Gosh. despite revenues only rising 11% in the year. So that would sort of immediately make me wonder what's So their there. clients aren't paying them very that, quickly. That's what it would seem to be. And you know, if you were to believe some of uh, what has been said, you know, maybe some of, you know, there's been question marks about the quality of those invoices. Okay. You know, I can't comment on that. Uh, equally, their creditors have gone up by a similar amount. So the question that I would then ask myself is, well, maybe people are paying them slowly and now they've just passed that burden on to their own creditors yeah. uh, and are, are not paying them. And that, that would sort of put a red flag in my mind. Um, so uh, tell it to actually go from, an op uh, from a post-tax profit of 16 million uh, to a figure of 51 million, which is called cash from operations. And from that, they make adjustments for the actual income tax paid and the actual interest paid on their debt. And they come up with a number for cash from operating activities of $47.6 million. Right. Now, uh, that number in my mind equates to the operating profit in the P&L account. And I often like to compare one with the other. And in this case, tell its number looks very impressive mm. because its operating cash flow is $47 million, but its operating profits uh, are only $20.5 million. Right. And in part, that's because they've added back some $24 million on depreciation and amortisation. So the story is really good from that point of view. And some investors who only focused at that metric would think, well, this is a very cash generative business. But if they look a little deeper and look to see the whole story, mm. they would look at what uh, other expenditures the companies have has had and those have been quite significant so in 2016 the company spent nine million dollars on capital expenditure it spent close to two million on acquiring other intangible assets and it spent a staggering 30.7 million dollars 
on software development costs. So these were costs that were incurred within the business that they've chosen not to leave in the profit and loss account as a cost, but they've put them to the balance sheet. Um, and what, what that means is that free cash flow um, has, is just 6.2 million. Right. So their earnings have gone from 16 million, and I, I regard free cash flow as the equivalent number in the cash flow statement. Yeah. Uh, their free cash flow is $6 million, mm -hmm. which represents only 37% of their uh, earnings have converted into, into free cash. So I would pay a lot, you know, a lot of attention to that number. Presumably it can change over time. This might be a very capital intensive year for them, and therefore, it gives you this picture, whereas another year it might be very so different. A, a very good point. And what one does need to be very careful and be too simplistic uh, when analysing a free cash flow statement. In the case of Tellit, though, they spent $26 million last year and their free cash flow conversion ratio was 39% okay. then. So uh, I haven't gone back beyond that, but I would certainly be worried if a company was always, was was growing was converting so little of their cash flow unless of course their revenues were growing very significantly and that was taking up a lot of working capital and a lot of capital expenditure i mean what's odd though in the tellit numbers is that revenues have increased just 11 percent and yet they've still only been, a been able to convert 37 percent of their earnings into cash yes and that gives you a good enough picture without looking over say five years of um the figures yeah, yeah. I mean, it certainly would be a starting point. And certainly if I was reviewing this uh, as my first thing I was going to read, I would then move on to the other statements and, and to the blurb. But, but you know, I find that, that, you know, that it's very helpful to, to, to look at the numbers first because it sense checks everything else management has to say. And, you know, and I go to management presentations and there's some very charming and effective uh, salespeople who brought companies to, to the junior market yeah. in London. Uh, there's, there's one or two fraudsters, there's, the occasion, there's quite a few dreamers. They're all typically very charming and very persuasive. And I think it's very helpful to have uh, something to be able to, to check, to test out the sense of what they're saying. And I know it's an example I've used in the past, but I went to a presentation by the CEO of Silverdell. Uh, this is a company that was involved in the decommissioning of nuclear power stations. And they made a great emphasis of how they're the market leader. And this is a specialist niche area and they're the dominant player. But they were generating just a 1% operating margin. So I'm asking myself, how can, how can a company that is the market leader have so little pricing yeah. power? And therefore I was able to sort of go ignore all the all the words, all the nice words and all the big talk and actually get to the heart of the matter. And as you know, the company went bankrupt yeah. two or three years ago. And um, talking about talking to management, you are quite keen to ask around the amortisation of intangible assets, which is what you're talking about here. What's your view on that? Yes. Well, um, I've, I mean, maybe it's helpful for your, for your viewers to understand how amortisation works. That and, would be great. Uh, there's two accounting uh, standards that work here. The first one is IFRS 3, and that deals with uh, business combinations. So it's, it's uh, intangibles arising from that. And maybe by example, uh, if a company is uh, bought out for 200 million, but it's physical assets, it's hard assets, mm. if you like, it's factories, it's debtors, et cetera, less it's physical liabilities, it's trade creditors. Uh, let's say all of that added up to 100 million, so it's net asset value. Yeah. Somehow us accountants have got to deal with the balance. You know, we, we're into double entry bookkeeping. We've got cash going out. We've got physical assets on the other side, 100 million. What are we going to do with the remaining yeah. 100 million? And I, IFRS 3 encourages management to look at that, what I call goodwill, yeah. and then allocate part of that goodwill to specific intangibles. So it might be uh, a database. It might be customer relationships. Yeah. It might be IP. And the argument being that in the same way that physical assets are of ongoing use within the business, then these intangibles are also of use going forward in the business. Mm. But I think, uh, and, and I should say that those intangibles are written off over say three to 10 years to the profit and loss account. Yeah. And you'll often see that amortization charge coming through. Many companies choose to add that back to their profit number um, it, when they to produce an adjusted number. 
the other part that is not written through the PL as they go along is called goodwill. Mm. And that typically goes into the balance sheet and stays at that value. Now, it's tested every year, mm. and the accountants will ask management to prepare a discounted cash flow for that part of the business mm. to see if it can support that that value. And if it's judged that that business is no longer profitable or sufficiently profitable, there could be a, a one-time charge to the PL account where the value of the goodwill is written down and you see a PL charge in the in the profit and loss account. Um, so uh, the other type of amortization arises where companies, and this is often the case where you've got a biotech company, a software company, uh, or a company like YouGov, uh, where they choose to capitalize some of their expenses. And it might relate to developing a new drug, or it could be developing a new piece of software for resell or for internal use. In the case of YouGov, they have a customer panel uh, where they have drawn five million people together who they can survey on behalf of their, yeah. their customers. And they choose to capitalize that expense and then write it off progressively. And that's caught under a, an accounting standard called IAS 38. Yeah. Uh, but in my mind, these two types of amortization that come are quite different. They can be overlap, but I won't go into that yeah, into this yeah. uh, interview. But, but, but in my view, they're quite distinct. And the way I like to look at it is that uh, the, the amortization arising from acquisitions, I like to ignore. Uh, but I do treat the amortization arising from internal developments and internal spending as a genuine cost in the business. In that year that it happens? Um, no, I don't necessarily need to, I mean, that's where I'd be looking at the free cash flow statement quite okay. separately and then seeing that sp spending. But no, when I am then looking at the profit and loss account, uh, then I will take into account the, uh, I will add back the amortization of acquired intangibles through a business combination, but I, I won't add back uh, amortization that's arisen in the ordinary course of business, you know, just uh, developing a, a new piece of software or a a consumer panel. So you wrote about YouGov in a recent ShareSock article um, where you were talking about their amortisation of um, intangible assets and you weren't completely comfortable with that. Can you tell us more? Yeah, sure. Um, so as I mentioned just previously, uh, YouGov uh, capitalised the cost of their customer or consumer panel. I can't quite remember how they describe it. And they also capitalised quite a bit of their uh, software mm. development cost. Nothing wrong with that. Mm. You know, their argument is that it's for the benefit of the business going forward and they want to match off mm. the costs against the income. I, I don't really have a problem there. But um, in their accounts, uh, their profit after tax, after all amortisation and all other costs, uh, was 4.6 million, which equates to 4.2p of earnings per share. Now that's quite steep yeah. when one looks at the share price at mm. the moment, which is uh, 318 pence. Um, now the way that YouGov uh, argue it is to add back to that uh, a reported number, mm. uh, various various costs. The first one being amortization. Mm. Uh, and they add the whole lot back, the six and a half million. Now of that six and a half million, just a million arose from acquisitions. Yeah. But the remainder arose from writing off money previously spent on software development and on the consumer and customer panel. And that to me feels like a, a real and genuine cost of the business. So I cannot for the life of me see how you can add that back to your profit number. The second add back they give is relates to share based payments. Now, that's one and a half million in their case. Now, lots of companies add that back. To their profit and loss, but you know, my view is that it is a real cost of the business. I mean, as Warren Buffett said uh, when asked this question, he said, "Well, if it's not a cost, what is it?" Mm. And uh, particularly in a people-based business such as YouGov, I think it's important to recognise it as a cost. Now, in the cash flow statement, yes, it gets added back because it's non-cash. Mm. Fine, and I'll mm. judge it for its merits mm. and that. But you know, when you add it back to the PL, you're really confusing your apples with your pears. I feel. Mm. And then the last add back they do is exceptional costs of half a million. Now, YouGov have had exceptional exceptional costs every year that I've looked at going back to 2012. So they're not quite so exceptional as they first appear. Um, now, if you if you add all of that back and then adjust for the notional tax and all those add backs, you get from a figure of 4.6 million profit after tax before to 11.4 million profit after tax now. It looks much nicer. Very different picture. And the earnings per share rise from 4.2 to very close to 11p per share. 
Uh, now, the problem with that is that a lot of these data aggregators, they don't look necessarily at the accounts per se. They, they will pick up often the adjusted number. Yeah. And so, you know, you can end up in a situation where the market gets quite distorted focused around an adjusted number. But I think it's very cheeky of you, Gov, to be adding back the amortization for, you know, what I regard as, as real day-to-day -day expenses of the business. Yes, it distorts the figures. So looking at the profit and loss account and looking at the balance sheet, what other ratios do you look at? Well, I always like to see uh, businesses um, that generate high profit margins. I've used the example of Silverdale uh, earlier. You know, and, and I often think that it demonstrates pricing power and also leverage within the business. Um, so, for instance, Biventix, a company that I'm often associated <laughs> with, their operating margins are 79% for Phenomenal. financial year yes. 17. Uh, by comparison, YouGov, based upon its reported numbers, uh, is 13.6%. Um, what sort of profit margin do you like to look for? So I normally like to look at margins sort of over over twenty percent, uh, typically, um, and I tend to I, I go out of my way to avoid businesses generating single digit operating margins. And you're not bothered about the sector. You don't look at what's normal in the sector. Well, I, I'll combine the, my view on operating margins with how efficiently capital is being used in the business. So, if it was a high profit margin business but a very low return on capital in business, capital employed business, I wouldn't be interested. Equally, you can sometimes get a low profit margin business that has very good returns on capital. Uh, so it's not always, I'll, I'll tend to use a number of different ratios. But you're not comparing different companies in no, the same sector yeah. to no, work no. out what sort of percentages? I might look at companies in the same sector for comparison purposes, yeah. But okay. I, I wouldn't necessarily look at uh, other sectors. No, okay. Um, so, the other measures I like to use really all, all focus on the balance sheet, but I'm looking at the balance sheet from the point of view of how effectively the business uses those assets on the balance sheet, mm. as opposed to looking at the balance sheet as a defensive mechanism. So I'm not looking necessarily for hidden value within the fixed assets. Uh, I'm not always looking at it from the point of liquidity and solvency, and that's partly because I've sort of my focus on quality stocks tends to pre-screen out those. But I'm looking at how efficient management is in, in extracting profit and free cash flow from the assets that it has. And so the measures I like, uh, return on equity, uh, it's a very well-known measure. I mean, in the case of Bioventix, it's at 48.5%. And I mean, NewGov, just on its reported numbers, uh, are at 143 right. So, you know, and it's ironic that YouGov retained more of its profit than Bioventix. Bioventix, uh, retained only 10% uh, of its profit, distributed 90% last year, whereas YouGov, I think it was about 50-50. But on every pound retained by YouGov, they're generating a much lower return on equity uh, mm. than the, the, the Bioventics. So that's the way I tend to sort of look at it. Um, and then there's a, a metric that I use called return on total assets. Um, with Can one you of, give a definition of what that is? Yeah, so sure. So it's total assets, but I exclude goodwill and intangibles arising on acquisition. Because? Because uh, I want to try and understand how innately efficient the balance sheet is. So I'm, there are other measures that would cap capture uh, whether an acquisition has been worthwhile. So return on capital employed yep. and return on equity would tend to capture that. But what I like about return on tangible assets, or I call it row to X, excluding the acquired intangibles, is that it allows to, me to look at the innate efficiency of a balance sheet. So, so how much watering does that balance sheet yeah. need? So how, how, how often do fixed assets need to be replaced? How much uh, uh, are sales reliant on ever increasing debtors, et cetera? Um, and generally, the companies that have very high row to Xs generate very high free cash flows. And it goes back to a point you made earlier about you know, penalise a company for one year's big, big spending. Mm. Um, so the good thing with the Rotor X is that it's a good predictor of companies that are going to be good cash generators over the longer term. And there, you know, I'm often looking at you know, companies that might generate returns of sort of 20, 30, 30% 30 uh, per annum. Um, you know, Bioventics are at 56%. Wow. Yeah. And, and if you strip out the cash, which they often don't need anyway, yeah. um, it'd be over, it's 142%. So uh, 
you know, that compares in the case of YouGov to around 19% and 27% respectively based upon on, on, on the numbers. That, Do you know any you know, other company it. that's got the level of return that Biaventix uh, well, has? So, uh, um, Reckitt Bin Kaiser has a very high return on tangible assets. When I last looked, it was around 60 or 70%. Um, companies like IG Index have a very high return. Uh, I imagine Fever Tree would have a re very high return. So these are all generally capital light businesses that are strong, not because by virtue of their assets, mm. but because of their business franchise. Mm. So either they have uh, a piece of IP, they have some know-how, mm. they have strong brand, mm. and that allows them to uh, have a dominant position within their particular marketplace, uh, and that's reflected in their margins and in their returns of capital. I mean, Fever Tree employed just 40 people. Yes. All the bottling and, and everything else is done externalized. And the nice thing with that is that all those expenses are recognized straight away. Yeah. Whereas, you know, with a company that's doing everything in-house, you know, you then get into the tricky issue of, well, what's going on to the balance sheet, yeah. what's going on to the P&L account? Any other ratios we should be looking at? Uh, well, from a valuation point of view, uh, you know, PE ratio is clearly something that pe people look at a lot. I mean, it's interesting using that example of uh, Bioventix and YouGov. Both companies have the, more or less the same forward PE ratio, 27 for Bioventix, mm. uh, 25 for YouGov. Uh, but, you know, to my mind, uh, the business characteristics of Bioventix mm. and its metrics are so strong that mm. I would always put that on a premium mm. over YouGov's, despite both businesses growing strongly in the past mm. and likely to do so in the future. Mm. Um, the other one I like is uh, looking at free cash multiples. So in the same way that you can value a company by the multiple of its earnings, you can go mm. to the, work out the free cash flow and work out how many times the company is being valued by reference to that free cash flow. Typically, you'll see that the multiples are higher, and that's because companies aren't converting 100% of their earnings into cash. And obviously, the, the less efficient they are in doing that conversion from earnings to cash, you'll then see a bigger gap opening up between their earnings multiple and their free cash flow multiple. Mm. And another thing I like to do is invert the free cash flow multiple to produce a yield, a free cash flow yield. Yes. Um, because that allows me then to compare an ass one investment against different types of asset classes, mm. such as bonds uh, or, or, or something else. And of course, the nice thing generally with shares, one hopes, is that they will continue to grow earnings, grow free cash flows, and therefore that free cash flow yield will sh should expand over time. And do you use that to predict a future price for the share? Um, sort of. I mean, I tend to reserve that for the larger holdings where I might have a price in mind. And I'll use yield and I'll use earnings and I'll use other metrics like that or maybe a possible takeout price. If, with, with a smaller mm. company, you can often expect some kind of acquisition exit at the end. Uh, but I'm not too hard and fast on it. So I won't go into an investment and say I'm going to be out at that price. You know, when I bought Bioventix at £2.60, I had in my mind about £15. <laughs> uh, but the business has gone along so much better than even I anticipated. Mm. You know, it supports what I say, you know, good things happen to good companies. Um, and you know, now the share price is £24. And, I, you know, I didn't sell a share at 15 uh, So I think you've got to be very flexible as an investor and always keep up to date with what's going on. And as the case, business case changes, you've got to flex accordingly. And um, with these ratios, do you use them for screening? Uh, yes, I do, yeah. So I'll use, uh, like a lot of people, Stockopedia. I think it's a fantastic product. Uh, and I will use them as part of my screening exercise, yes. Tremendous. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's given a very clear overview of what to be looking for in accounts. So thank you very much, Leon. Thank you.